fruits of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we shall be so in the likeness of his resurrection also. For we know that our old self has been crucified with him, in order that the body of sin may be destroyed, that we may no longer be slaves to sin. For he who is dead is acquitted of sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live together with Christ. For we know that Christ, having risen from the dead, dies now no more. Death shall no longer have dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But for the life that he lives, he lives it unto God. Thus do you consider yourselves also as dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the Gospel is from St. Matthew. Mark. At that time, there were, when there was a great crowd with Jesus, and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples together and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd, for behold, they have now been with me three days, and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away to their homes fasting, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from a distance. And his disciples answered him, How will anyone be able to satisfy these with bread here in the desert? And he asked them, How many loaves have you? And they said, Seven. And he bade the crowd to recline on the ground. Then, taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to distribute. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few little fishes. And he blessed them and ordered them to be distributed. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up what was left of the fragments, seven baskets. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000 and dismissed them. Have a seat. Young Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost, Amen. My dear faithful, it's quite amazing to see uh, in the details of the Gospel of today that the crowd had followed our Lord for three days without eating. It's quite, quite something. Who, which, uh, which preacher in the world ever held a crowd of 4,000 without any food for three days? So it must have been quite something for our Lord when our Lord was preaching. St. John says, there are plenty of other things that happen in the Gospel and the whole, all the books of the world do not suffice to contain them all. So this crowd following our Lord for three days, being captivated by the words of our Lord, what was our Lord preaching to them? And for so long. And our Lord was able to hold their minds captive for three days. And then the other mystery is that these, for most of these people, were not found pleasing before God. And they all left our Lord. They all abandoned Him. They did not take the words of our Lord on the mystery of the Holy Eucharist. They refused to believe. There was, you know, it's what you see clearly in John chapter 6. They could not take it. They said, this is crazy. How can this man give us his uh, flesh to eat? So on the one side, you get this, this wonderful and powerful manifestation of the humanity of our Lord and his divinity, which... Which, uh, which shows itself by the power of his doctrine because he was, he was preaching as one having authority. That is, he was not boring you know, and dull like the scribes and Pharisees who were utterly boring and full of themselves. And on the other hand, you know, the, the crowd would not make any use of this abundance uh, uh, of wisdom that was there. A wisdom that so many kings, our Lord said, so many kings wanted to hear. The queen of Saba came from so far away just to hear Solomon. And there, is, there was, they had much more than a Solomon there. But this uh, fasting of three days of this crowd is also represents the hunger that we should have for the Holy Eucharist. And these, uh, this is the good that comes out of the uh, evil of this time, of the crisis of the church and the crisis of the society of St. Pius X. That, you know, the, mass, the masses are so far apart now for, for us that our hunger for the Eucharistic bread is much stronger. 
for this is a condition for the good reception of the Holy Eucharist, is that we'll be hungry for the, uh, the flame. We'll be hungry for the divine love, which is contained in this most powerful of all sacraments, in the highest of all sacraments. It's even higher than the sacrament of holy orders, because holy orders, even order is ordered to it, it's an order to the Holy Eucharist. And, um, and uh, look at how much Christ dismisses all these people. Just like so many people, so many Catholics were dismissed on the occasion of the Council of Vatican II. And now we see so many liberals within the realm of tradition are simply dismissed. Every time we take a picture of a community of monks or nuns or anything, we look at the picture and you see so many of them have fallen on the course of the years. So many of them dismissed. Like the 600,000 men of the Hebrews, all of them dismissed to the exception of two. What percentage is that? It's 99.98% or something like that. I didn't, I didn't take my calculator with me for this sermon. So God dismisses. If God doesn't see true love, if God doesn't see compliance with the first commandment of God, He simply presses the ejection button. Because the Catholic Church cannot go on with mediocrity. And it's not going to happen with uh, some sort of a, you know, Protestant, uh, you know, uh, light bulb, uh, you know, and screwing, uh, you know, ceremonies and with hallelujahs and everything. No, it's the way God you know, revives his church, a revival, in the eyes of God is a cutting of dead branches. Or cutting of branches that only have leaves. Like the fig tree. The fig tree was cursed by Christ because it only had leaves, promises. And on each of, the, on each of these on, on each of these leaves there is written, uh, you know, I will change tomorrow. But no fruits. And the anger of Christ is total when he doesn't see the fruits in the in the synagogue. So it's a terrible warning for us. It's a terrible warning. Because we shall be pruned in the same way if we do not take the lessons of this uh, crisis. We shall be pruned in the same way if we have the same beam in our eyes and the same refusal to uh, comply with the divine love. Because the first commandment says, you shall not love me halfway. I forbid you utterly to be lukewarm. I forbid you to put me as your second uh, highest priority. You shall think about me every day with your heart. You shall ponder my divine love every day in your heart. This is my command. This is why I have created you and I'm not taking you in heaven unless you do exactly that. That's the first commandment. So you're not going to heaven None of you are going to heaven unless you comply with this. Look at, the, you know, meditate on the severity. None of these people, it seems, when we reach uh, John chapter 6, none of these, hardly any of these people, only the apostles, would make it. And our Lord told them, and what about you? Do you also want to leave? If you want to leave, you can just join the others. And uh, St. Peter saves the day, famously. But the, the requirements are very strong. And this is a lesson for you faithful. And there is a lesson for us priests. Same thing. That the way we should have exercised our priesthood in the years prior to 2012 is the way we are exercising it today. Because we read the life of the saints. We read the, the story of the Jesuit reductions where you had only two priests for 6,000 Indians. And all the, uh, the other saints were very hard at work. Very, very hard at work. Don Bosco was so hard at work that when he would write a letter, he would give the letter to his secretary. And by the time the secretary would write the, find the address, write with the address, put the stamp, seal the letter, or fold the paper and put it in the, in the envelope and seal the letter, Don Bosco would send him another letter. Or when St. Thomas Aquinas was writing his books, he had four secretaries. And he was capable to dictate four different part of the small of, of, of his treatises and his books simultaneously to four secretaries. St. Thomas Aquinas was so hard at work that any book he read, he memorized. St. John Chrysostom had the entire 
uh, um, New Testament or the entire Bible memorized word for word. The works of Saint Augustine are massive, massive. In a time where when it took so long to write, Origen, who is not even a saint, puts the entire scripture into six columns, into six columns with all the uh, the original languages of the of, of scripture. The curé of ours would sleep two hours at night, and they were hard at work, and that's the way the curé of ours was trained by even by his parents. His his work on the vine was so tiring. And the vine is very is a very mystical tree because you know it, it, it's very abundant in its fruits, but it requires a lot of work. You have to cut the branches, three on them. You can only have three uh, of them. You have to hang them, like our Lord was hanging on the cross. You have to hang them. You gotta tie them, and then you have to remove the little uh, offshoots of uh, you know green offshoots, because otherwise they're gonna go erratic and become too big. And the wine is uh, the, the vine is not gonna bear any fruit otherwise. You gotta take the weeds around the the vine. And then you have to pass regularly in the vine. You got to, you know, chase the insects, the the, the pests, and uh, and it's it's a lot of work, so much work that when he was young, he had a statue of our Blessed Mother, and he would throw it a few meters further to give himself courage, because he was working the whole day in the vine of his father, and that's really toughening up for the work. That was to come. Same work as Padre Pio, who spent all his, all his uh, days in the, in the confessional. And Padre Pio was extremely tough. His sufferings were intense. So that, you know, one day when he had a hernia, he asked, he, uh, the, the doctor came and operated him on the spot, and Padre Pio requested not to be anesthetized. And there was no change on his face. He took the entire pain of the... Uh, uh, having our operation without any anesthetics. And so they were so tough and they were so hard at work. And then we had you know, cushions, we had pillows uh, under all of our fingers. And we were told, don't overextend yourself in the apostolate, don't do too much, you're gonna, you're gonna explode and so on and so forth. But the proof is there, you know, a crazy rhythm, which is not so crazy, which is not so uncomfortable, I guarantee you which is not so heroic, not so saintly, but we've survived, more than survived this crazy, uh, this seemingly crazy rhythm. I'm surprised that my sleep has never been better than in those days of more intense activity. But I'm not, I do not arrive into the ankle of those giants of holiness, uh, of priestly predecessors of old. And so it's also a lesson for us priests these, uh, these punishments are a lesson for us priests that we were too complacent. So um, let us not be uh, complacent. In, uh, let us uh, take our, our God seriously. It is called the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to realize that this is a serious business. This is a serious business and you, the battle is not won. You cannot take things for granted. It's not possible. And if, if, you lay, if you let down your guard, you have opposite of you a very experienced enemy who uh, exploits any weakness you are so kind to present to him for his victory. Any weakness shall be totally exploited. We see, you see how much the devil in the world of the resistance is trying to penetrate. You know, whichever avenue he finds, he, uh, he enters. Like he, there he found a, a fault you know, in, in Quebec you know, with this issue of celibacantism. And he's really trying to enlarge it, enlarge it, and, and, and enter the, the breach. And so if we, uh, if we do not plug the breach, then it gets wider and it, be it becomes a bigger mess. And so we have sustained you know, priestly casualties in Germany from uh, celibacantism. And then we lost this Carmel of Brillon Val, they are gone. Maybe they were already celibacantus, I suppose that they were seeing this before. But you see how much the devil is using the least uh, opportunity you give him. And if you don't weed your uh, dominant defect, then it becomes uh, really big. 
our enemy is not taking any siestas, he's not on strike like the French workers, or he's not on vacation, and he's not working part time, yeah, and he doesn't take any sleep. There is no, uh, no coffee break with him, nothing. He never stops, and he fights the harder, uh, the more as he realizes that time is short for him. And he's uh, very experienced, and, he, uh, and he's requesting his enemies to be all peaceful and peaceniks, while all he thinks about is to fight. And uh, good generals, you know, a general, uh, I think, uh, von, uh, von Manstein, was happy one day about some of his soldiers, and he told them, you know, you fought like devils. There is no greater compliment you can make to soldiers. Because in this, the devil is to be imitated. Because he is really, really highly motivated. While his motives are the wrong ones, it's pure, sheer hatred and envy. Hatred of God, especially. Hatred of our blessed mother. But the way he fights is worthy of great admiration. So, let us not be, uh, you know, taken in the vortex of the slush. The, the, the whole civilization of today, the whole suburban civilization, is to make a, a, a jellyfish, a marshmallow, out of you. That's, that's, what the, that's what you want. Because it's the perfect ground for... for you, the souls lose, their, lose themselves naturally in this, uh, in this mush. So refuse, refuse this mush. And remember your ancestors. Your ancestors who kept the faith, those who came over in America, had it very hard. When they landed in America, they were persecuted by the by the wasps, the nativists. And uh, maybe uh, maybe in Canada was easier uh, because we are in Canada here. <laughs> but uh, at least uh, you know the, uh, the Catholic minorities were uh, very persecuted in the, in the beginning, or the uh, the Irish in Ireland, and that really uh, helped them to keep the faith. And, uh, what I've seen in India, those parts of the Novus Ordo in India, which are more persecuted by the Hindus, have, have, have kept a, a strong faith. And they, uh, despite 50 years of Novus Ordo, they still believe in, in hell, in purgatory, in, in Our Lady, and in the Rosary, etc. So for us, it's, um, it, we, it's important that we uh, take the lesson of what's happening in the world of tradition. So as to be able to simply uh, survive and save our soul, our most precious soul, and imitate Our Lady with an army in a battle array, we never allowed her heart. She never allowed her heart to sleep. There was always an immense blaze of love, of charity in her heart. So uh, all the people she entered into contact were always leaping with joy. Always, uh, were never they were never missing any abundance of grace. And at the foot of the cross. She was all uh, belonging to our Lord Jesus Christ. She was full of the desire to die with Him, to be with Him in His passion. And if she was dying of something, it was of dying of not dying with Him, not being able to lay down her, her life in return for what her son was doing for her, to purify her, to, to, not to purify her, but to, to obtain in advance, to, to obtain for her what she got in advance everyone else. This preservation uh, from original sin at the moment of her immaculate conception. In the name of Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost.